Good, we still have some people joining, but uh, let's uh, start this session. Welcome back to LCN 2021, day three, Wednesday. Hopefully you had a nice experience from yesterday. We had keynotes, technical sessions, we had another quiz and so on. And maybe some of you were in the wonder tool also after. I was a bit too tired myself. Sorry, I need to close down my phone from this end. Um, today, we have um, another very interesting day with different sessions. So it's a great honor to present our third keynote speaker, Professor Matti Latva Aho. He is a director for the 6G flagship program in Oulu, Finland, not too far away from where I'm residing here on the Swedish side. He serves as an academic, academic professor at the University of Oulu. And the title of his talk is 6G, The Road Ahead. So please join me in welcoming Professor Matti Latva Aho. Thank you, Carl. And good morning, everybody in Canada. And good evening, good afternoon, everywhere else, wherever you might be located. It's a great pleasure to have the chance to talk to you about our, our 6G program and our visions, how we see 6G building up in the future. Our program is one of the uh, very few national flagship activities that our previous government launched already uh, in May 2018. So this is an eight year program with total volume of almost 300 million euros. And it's composed of multiple independent projects, as well as um, government seed funding, which is about 10% to get organized and, and provide necessary support functions. Uh, I will start my presentation uh, in a minute with, with one vision video that we prepared for this national flagship competition already uh, late 2017. So it's not totally fresh vision video, but it shows very much the type of things that we are thinking about that we need to look at uh, um, for, for 6G. And hopefully you get an understanding from this video how many different technologies are actually necessary to make it real.
right, so this shows some of the <clears throat> potential applications in the future and also highlights that we need to look at lots of different technological enablers when trying to build uh, 6G uh, for the future. So in our program, we are having so-called four strategic research areas, wireless connectivity, trying to push wireless connectivity to the limits of, of um, theory and trying to get extremely good performance out of it, whatever this performance means. It can mean uh, extreme broadband, it can mean uh, high reliability, low latency, or it can mean also very accurate positioning. So whatever is the application. Uh, that's probably our largest research area currently. Then implementation technologies, mainly devices and circuit technologies, looking at how to implement radios in the future when the center frequency is approaching sub terahertz frequencies. So we are going towards 100 gigahertz and above, and uh, we have very broad bandwidths. And uh, so there are lots of new requirements to, to implementation, starting from material technologies as, as for example, current antenna materials are not very good radiators when we go to above 100 gigahertz center frequency. Distributed computing, edge intelligence, and, and in introduction of AI and machine learning type of things to be part of mobile cellular networks. Uh, so that is increasingly important trend. And we are also, of course, investigating multiple aspects related to that. Services and applications area is really, uh, it's a multidisciplinary research area. We are of course looking at system requirements coming from different types of future services. Uh, introduction of machine type of communications has increased the application space dramatically. And it means also that uh, the communication system requirements vary depending on the exact application scenario. So we have to understand uh, um, deeply enough different areas in order to define the requirements, in order to be able to uh, come up with the good solutions for making services smooth. Also, we are looking at uh, future ecosystems and related businesses, business models, techno-economics. As uh, we see already now that uh, introduction of, of uh, 5G already now to different fields of industries and society has, has started to introduce newcomers to be part of the value chains and ecosystems. And, and those are highly varying. You can imagine that if you are working in, in traditional mobile broadband, it's very different to, for example, looking at, at um, agriculture or healthcare services and so forth. So it's really broad setting of different types of research areas and exact topics. We have uh, currently uh, almost 400 researchers looking at these different areas. And uh, within our faculty, we have uh, six um, departments participating in this, in this um, program. We just finalized our midterm review process, and as a part of that, we had to refine our plans for the second phase of the flagship. Second phase starts next May 22 to 26, where we sharpened our goals for the future. And uh, um, we have these, the same four research areas with targeting at four goals. We want to, of course, excel in building necessary technology enablers. One important thing, part of our research is to validate and experiment um, the research findings by using our, our test network environment. I will explain that in a minute what it is. So we are uh, aiming at developing our current 5G test network towards 6G test network. We want to understand deeply selected vertical areas, not from only from technological point of view, but as ecosystems, how they should function, who are the players, how the value is generated to each stakeholder. And fourth, we would like to keep being strong in 6G 
opinion or six G vision leadership as we have we have started to to be uh, at least in the beginning of our, our program. We are also emphasizing a lot global collaboration. Uh, it's important to have have global views and and uh, share different views and visions since we are anyways going to target at eventually uh, global 60 standard or actually that's the task for the industry but but it starts already from the research phase so it's very important to understand different viewpoints the vertical areas that we have selected to be in the center of our our research are health industry vehicular and energy sectors all of those are very important uh, to Finland and in particular to to northern Finland and Oulu, Oulu region. Uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals is probably the most important, let's say, value base for starting to define the next generation technologies and, and solutions. Digitalization of modern societies is enabled by many different technologies and wireless connectivity is definitely one of those. In order to make these digital services available also for, for uh, remote and rural areas, not to mention developing countries and poor areas, uh, it requires special attention already from um, the system spe specification point of view and uh, what type of technologies can be introduced in sparsely populated areas in poor countries and areas. So it, it, it really, it's really important thing. We are most likely not looking at state of the art technologies for those, but for example, the range and coverage introduce very specific challenges in those. Uh, 6G standardization outline is not yet defined and uh, I think every every uh, company has their own view on that and it seems to be let's say changing uh, all the time and industry seems to accelerate it this represents already probably a little bit uh, uh, let's say not so fast uh, estimate for it but one thing is, is already decided that ITUR will, will release the 60 vision statement somewhere early 23. And then the requirements most likely will be placed for, for 60 uh, system much earlier than, than predicted here, maybe 25 already. And the first standard industry is pushing it to happen already during 28. And uh, so it's happening sooner than everybody was thinking in the beginning. Our test network environment is very important for us in collaboration within, within our partner organizations, other academics, within European uh, Union funded projects and activities. And we have successfully used it, for example, already in Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in 2018 in demonstrating millimeter wave uh, radio link activities uh, over there. So what we have currently is that we have operator create uh, a network at our campus with different uh, uh, network products, indoor small cells, macro cells, and uh, also currently installing millimeter wave uh, capable uh, uh, 5G commercial products there. We also have research equipment, which we call proof of concept devices of various sorts operating at different frequency bands. Um, we are now systematically pushing this environment to be 6G research capable so that we could run some validations and trials uh, during the uh, early phase of 6G uh, standardization process using our, our environment. Uh, it's an open test network. Anybody interested in collaborating with us, please contact us and we will see how can we collaborate. If you are keen on finding out other things that we have been doing, there are lots of materials on, online that you can try to reach out. 6G Waves magazine, which uh, is published twice per year. 
We have published also 13 thematic 6G white papers, which represents quite fresh uh, a view on, on what is relevant in 6G research, that those have been done in collaboration with a quite extensive um, international group of experts of, of maybe 300 persons coming from 100 organizations and 30 countries were participating and contributing. We are also active in organizing events. We have the 6C Summit event that now is teamed up with uh, European Union uh, uh, flagship event EU CNC. So it's jointly organized with European Commission. Uh, and we have this EU CNC 6C Summit event every June next year in France, Grenoble. So uh, let's look at next what we think about 60 system. Um, if you look back, mobile wireless has dramatically changed the way we humans behave in our daily lives. Uh, introduction of mobile phones was fantastic thing. Introduction of mobile broadband to mobile handsets was even better. And now uh, uh, mobile cellular systems are extending to connect also machines processes, different things to make sure that we can uh, um, automate lots of routine type processes in, in our living environments. And also to make sure that machines could do certain type of things far more reliably compared to human beings. So this gives possibilities to, to extend different uh, uh, wireless connectivity to different new application fields, some examples shown here, and these all are very different in nature. The value generation mechanisms are diff very different. The type of players in the value chains and ecosystems are extremely different. And also the communication requirements when trying to automate some of the underlying routines and things under these application areas are very, very different. What more is different in these areas is the legislation and regulation. And now we are still struggling with the introduction of 5G to these machine type connectivity solutions in different segments of society and industries. It's starting, but starting much slower than everybody was wishing for. And I dare to claim that one reason for this slow start is that we don't really understand well enough the value chains related to these key vertical areas. And uh, we haven't properly given chance yet the uh, different ecosystems to start to grow holistically based on their own needs. So I think this uh, telecom sector is now going through a major transition and we will start to see new stakeholders coming into play. Uh, smart regulatory decisions is really key thing in, in making future changes and these different vertical applications, application areas successful in the future. Uh, here is an example of spectrum related regulatory issues. This is an old schema we made already six, six years ago or so. Maybe we're kind of guessing what's, what 5G could be and would something come after that and at what spectrum bands and what does it imply in terms of, of networks and operating those networks. So it, it is actually turning out to be a little bit true that uh, we are starting to have new types of players coming to the market enabled by uh, radically new uh, spectrum licensing policies and with 5g there is already a concept called local 5g where regulator is giving uh, spectrum licenses to certain specific geographical area for a specific need and uh, examples that exist now, for example, in Germany and Japan, uh, they have given local licenses to, uh, to industrial areas for industrial players, for, for example. 
So when we move to higher spectrum bands, we start to see more open ecosystems driven by these vertical applications, whereas current um, uh, mobile network operators remain to be extremely important and necessary at, at lower spectrum bands as they have spectrum licenses at these good parts of spectrum, lower spectrum bands for the next 20, 25 years in the future. And it doesn't make much sense to start to rebuild uh, large area coverage uh, cellular systems and try to replace those. So, so those are definitely needed. And uh, these higher spectrum bands imply directly that the range of the systems is going to be a much shorter at those, those frequency bands. And we are really forced to local operations. I'm sure that we can find similar examples from other fields of regulation very easily uh, related to openness of data, for example, how data can be shared, or on the other hand, what, what cannot be shared. And, and lots of regulatory decision needs to be done uh, for data privacy related matters in the future. And there probe the scale of, of uh, opportunities for future businesses is much broader than in telco business alone. The overall 6G play, playground is very broad. The way we categorize different things is, of course, we have this technology uh, uh, centric areas that we are investigating and most of our activities is focused on that. There are some regulatory issues, especially related to spectrum regulation that, that uh, generates lots of research questions and issues. There are important things related to United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, how that is taken into consideration, what type of, of issues we have to look at there. And then, of course, uh, a future future business models, future ecosystems, looking at different verticals. So this really means that uh, a 6G playground, 6G research area is extremely broad. And there are lots of things to, to be looked at also from academic research point of views. Once we start to uh, uh, develop any communication technology to be standardized, we have to define what are the key performance indicator, indicators, what are the technical requirements for the system. So as we know, quite often we define uh, uh, transmission capability related parameters like data rate, latency, uh, uh, and, and things like that. But there are also maybe some new technical parameters that need to be defined, for example, related to uh, positioning accuracy and also a clock chitter related things and uh, issues related to uh, global or extended range of systems and, and so on. Also, of course, the targets that were set years back for 5G, they have to be revisited and we have to check what, how, how, how the targets are set for the next generation. Are some of those still valid? How do we change them and why? What are the expected future applications and services for which 6G is made? Energy efficiency is becoming increasingly important and, and energy KPIs will be having much bigger role than in past. Then there are lots of soft, softer, uh, let's say, value-based requirements that we have to try to quantify a little bit. Privacy, security, trust-related matters, ethics-related KPIs. How do we, for example, uh, uh, try to prevent development of, how should I say, police, state, surveillance, surveillance type of system development, which is not really the target of, of any commercial communication system. Transparency uh, are related to, for example, artificial intelligence, what information is collected and what is, what is made out of that. 
and also how do we make sure that these important vertical players are included in the definition and requirements of standards. But there are a lot of different issues, hard and soft issues. And, and again, I think as we are now living through major transition in, in mobile communications, also maybe the, the next generation regulatory and standards process need to take all these issues into consideration early enough. 6G is, of course, for super efficiency. We target at making it far better technically than 5G was. People are already talking about terabit per second uh, connectivity, uh, data rates, reliability targets higher than with 5G, as well as absolute security, so-called zero latency experienced at, um, at the application layer, maybe uh, centimeter level positioning, uh, global coverage, fully automated network optimization and deployment, as well as smart context dependent services. Uh, also utilization of our senses better and fully is of course one target. Um, these are many of these are let's say different types of superlatives and and uh, when we try to meet this all these requirements it's pulling the system optimization to quite different directions leading to contradictory contradictory system requirements so we don't need all these characteristics to be fulfilled at the same time for every single application so we need to look at how to optimize these uh, um, different vertical specifics, uh, which are important for that particular application. And then only later on, we should see, can we make a uniform system, co system concept out of that? Uh, we carried out this white paper process, investigating lots of different key aspects related to 6C research. And, and those can be downloaded from our website. And uh, I'm now showing some of the highlights as examples of what, what can be found from here. Uh, very concrete example. Uh, we looked at uh, different types of vertical application areas, industrial, uh, automotive, health, energy, finance, safety, agriculture, and then plotted uh, with, some, with some assumptions concerning the typical applications in those verticals, what are the required data rates, latencies, link budgets, and so forth. And as you can see, by quickly comparing those numerical values, uh, which are there, they vary hugely. So it's easy to understand that maybe we cannot come up with a, a very good technical solution satisfying all these different verticals, but we need really vertical specific system optimization or customization. Ma machine type communications uh, has to extend from this 5G uh, introduced simple uh, um, URLLC and, and massive IoT things. We have to look at uh, issues like security, privacy, trust related to those. We have to look at different efficiency aspects, not just energy efficiency, but also cost efficiency. The big question is that, can we make those uh, uh, ultra reliable low latency uh, connectivity solutions affordable financially? Sensing capabilities of different sorts, positioning is easy to understand, but there are of course many other types of of sensors and sensing capabilities that are definitely needed and more, maybe even more me needed for machine type communications uh, compared to uh, uh, human originated communications. One special characteristics about machine type connectivity is that quite often uh, the uplink direction requires higher capacity than downlink, which is most often the case uh, for human broadband connectivity. So it's a big difference. Um, 
accurate localization becomes possible and nice uh, uh, if we can really make these uh, sub terahertz or terahertz uh, transmission possible. We have extremely high bandwidth uh, for the system and high center frequency, meaning that we can theoretically have extremely accurate uh, time reference, meaning that we can calculate the position very, very accurately. Going to these high frequencies also means that we have very dense antenna arrays in place, uh, giving us chance to also utilize the spatial domain in positioning uh, uh, applications. So it's really powerful and, and straightforward to make high accuracy positioning possible, opening up huge application space uh, for the future. So there are a lot of different things that we can do with radio-based positioning. And uh, we don't have the limitation of the GPS, which we cannot hear indoors, for example, and, and it's not very high accurate accuracy even. Unfortunately, there are lots of challenges. Uh, most of the challenges are related to implementation challenges, uh, hardware complexity and cost, heating problems, for example, when we are trying to pack lots of antenna elements to very uh, small area uh, with power amplifiers and stuff, it, it, it's really serious issue to conduct heat away. Uh, uh, also, uh, at high frequencies, um, the coverage is a challenge. It most likely requires line of size, side um, connectivity. So, so signals can be easily blocked. Uh, edge intelligence is elegant way to try to try to provide uh, local, locally uh, aware or context aware applications in the future, and uh, we can bring a lot of computational capabilities to the edge cloud and uh, distribute the computing tasks locally uh, amongst different devices and so forth. So this edge cloud paradigm shift is definitely uh, one of the key characteristics that is now ongoing and will be uh, hopefully taken to the next level uh, when 6G standard is, is becoming mature. So. If you think about uh, uh, AI type of algorithms and AI type of applications, which are based on centralized processing, heavy processing of a lot of data. Now with mobile distributed networks, we are distributing uh, the computational tasks and we can, we can have real time view to the system uh, come, and the data coming from various sources. So that's also a big challenge as we have to dynamically try to calculate uh, the uh, or run the AI algorithms. And it's, it's, it's really a, a hot research topic now in, in most of the research groups looking at 6G. Finally, uh, remote connectivity challenge is still there and digital divide is increasing. And uh, one problem probably that we have done so far or has been done so far that, that um, we try to offer same technologies with close to same quality of service targets to remote areas as we are used to in, in um, modern uh, societies or metropolitan areas. But quite often we should look at what is necessary service quality level and how can we offer solutions which they can afford many times these uh, latest findings let's say these uh, mimo techniques uh, at base stations for example they they are not at all cheap uh, question is do are they really needed if the if the um, on the other hand there is currently nothing yet so maybe we should tune uh, um, proven technologies 
in those cases. Another uh, approach is that we actually uh, have, have developed jointly with uh, Lula University of Technology. We talked about this digital oasis concept where we can have anywhere around the world, we can have locally extremely super smart uh, wireless connectivity uh, solutions with all kinds of applications needed to run the local settlement or community. But there is not always a backhaul connection to the rest of the internet or the backhaul connection is very limited. So, so that's one, one way to try to solve these societal challenges. This is my last slide. So uh, the critical drivers in pushing 6G de development can be um, can be categorized to these four categories. They are societal, business, standards, and technology-related drivers. Societal ones relate to digital inclusion and digitalization of societies. Uh, Business-related is related to new ecosystems and disruptive business models coming from the needs of different vertical application areas. And, and uh, in order to make that happen, we need to Radi radically change the regulation of, of the key fields. Standards related is related to uh, global collaboration. And now the geopolitical situation is not the easiest possible. And uh, it's, it will be interesting to see what happens. But of course, industry is wishing still to have one uniform global standard for 6G as well. Uh, technology drivers are different, of course, depending on the researcher that you are talking to. Every researcher has his likings and dislikings. This is a collection uh, of our, our flagship and uh, highlighting the most key critical areas. I'll start from data privacy and security. Uh, if this vision of vertical application areas dominance is true in the future, it means that there will be a huge number of new entrants in different ecosystems. We will not know necessarily in the future whose network we are accessing to, who is offering the applications and services. So there are, of course, some, some security issues, which is reflected to probably some privacy issues. And of course, trust uh, uh, can be lost easily. Future network architectures, again, if we, if we believe that these verticals are coming into play quite drastically and, and will change the whole field, uh, the end users don't really care how to, or, or what network do they access to in the end of the day. They are only keen on getting different types of services which are highly uh, context uh, dependent. So we, if we are at office, if we are at home, if we are shopping mall, I think we are after different types of services always. So these service-centric network architectures are now discussed within, within research community. And it will be interesting to see how much of that can be really taken to be part of next generation uh, mobile network architecture and when that might happen. Uh, radio related challenges uh, are related to the super efficiency, super efficiency meaning extreme speeds, reliability, latency, localization or sensing accuracy, uh, in particular at higher spectrum bands. Artificial intelligence uh, I already discussed, and it's both utilized in optimizing and operating the networks, as well as making AI-based applications more powerful, more dynamic, more real-time than ever before. Thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, I would be happy to take those. Thanks a million, Matti. Very nice to see all them. All the work you do over in Finland and together with partners also. Uh, I could start uh, many interesting areas, including both the new spectrum, new radio interfaces and the core networks, edge things that you mentioned. But I would like to ask a little bit about the rural connectivity. Both you and me are located in quite 
sparsely populated areas in North Finland and North Sweden. So far, going from the analog systems over to 2D, etc., then we had quite good coverage in our areas. Then with 3D and 4D and now 5D, it seems to be more and more ultra dense scenarios in big cities, etc. And it's there is always a risk that we will be left behind. What is your vision about 60? Is is there a solution for better coverage in rural areas with 60 as you touched upon? How is that? Because the trend has not been so promising from going from 2D to 5D. I would like to hear your, your point on, on your viewpoint on that. I think the key thing is how do we provide backhaul connectivity? And 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 that that's the the most important thing. And uh, and then there are also areas where we don't even have uh, electricity. So we have to generate the power for the access points or base stations at the spot. So we need to utilize renewable energy sources like wind and solar and have batteries and so forth. And uh, so backhauling, we know that uh, there are different satellite uh, initiatives around the world uh, at different stages. But I have my doubts how affordable that will be in the end of the day. And in particular for developing countries, I don't think that's going to be the uh, massive scale solution. So something else needs to be done for that. Then if I look at Nordics, we have a quite good network of digital TV um, towers around our Nordic and remote areas. And each of those will ha has optical fiber going to the, the broadcast tower. And th that broadcast tower network can easily be utilized to transmit a lot of things. But on top of that, I think we need always, in order to increase coverage, relay station uh, extensions. And some some things like that, I think, will be will be needed and necessary. And then, of course, at as low frequency band as possible to have coverage. Definitely not at millimeter waves and uh, things like that. And most likely also quite simple technologies. LTE is probably the most complex technology that anybody would like to try to introduce to this remote area solutions. Even GSM has its place in, in many occasions. Correct, good, that's also my view. Seems we have a lot of common interests, Matti. Let's see if some of our friends here have questions or comments. Just speak out loud and you don't need to raise your hand or you can write in the chat also. I can mention Matti, I've been in contact with Digita in Finland. They are the owners of those towers that you talked about. We have Paracom here in Sweden also. So that would be interesting to see their, their future role. Let's see, yeah, someone is on coffee break. That is not the hand. <laughs> Yes, Anura, do you want to pose a question to Matti? Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so my my question is about the uh, research related to privacy that you carry out. Uh, so, in uh, most of the time, we uh, we see privacy lumped together with security and trust. Uh, what what specifically are you doing in privacy area? Uh. <sighs> Privacy, privacy area is not exactly on our academic research scope. One of our adjunct professors is very active in, in ISO standardization related to data privacy. And it's about uh, uh, how, to, how to define, uh, how should, I'm not a, privacy person myself, but how to how to filter necessary metadata out of huge amount of communal data, for example, that private citizens are, are generating and then let's say cities and, and governments own that database and they how they can start to share that. And that needs to be standardized and that's now under standardization. And if you think about 
5G and in the future 6G uh, going to new fields of, of, of applications. There are huge amounts of different gadgets and sensors generating that data. It is more important than ever before to have very clear understanding what data can be shared and how and what can be done out of that. And of course, it's still a big, big debate or dilemma in Europe. We have this GDPR uh, uh, laws uh, imposed by European Union that at what we have to comply. Whereas in, in, for example, in the US, there are these companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and, and God knows what they do with our private data. So, so that type of privacy issues need to be globally agreed. And some standards are required. And that journey has just started. It's, it takes many, many years to solve those things. Thank you. We have room for one or two more questions until we need to wrap up. Anyone? Early in the morning, at London time, late in Europe. But if anyone. So if not, then we thank Matti again for this very interesting keynote. And you can see the web page or the um, link that uh, Matthias just put there. So it's I could assure it's a lot of interesting work. So thanks again, Matti. We will stay in touch and I will continue to work with your your colleagues at the 6G flagship program over at your place. So please join me and in, in giving our hands for Matti. Thank you, Carl, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, thanks a lot. We stay in touch. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Bye. Bye-bye.